On the Infrastructure Bank, Division 18, Sub Clause 22.2 of your Budget Bill says, and I quote, the Minister of Finance, on the recommendation of the designated Minister, may make a loan or provide a loan guarantee with respect to the infrastructure project. If you loan, say, a billion dollars of taxpayers' money to a company to build infrastructure, and that company goes bankrupt, who will repay Canadian taxpayers their billion dollars? Mr. Minister? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing up the uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank. We, uh, we believe that this institution will enable us to produce more infrastructure across this country than would be the case if we didn't put it in place. And who would repay the billion dollars? What we look towards doing is thinking about how we can attract additional money into infrastructure, projects that wouldn't otherwise get done. So the institution will be able to uh, use the $15 billion of uh, money we've put from our $180 billion over the next 10 years, as well as use the uh, $20 billion in capital that the institution will have to make projects work. The specifics and the of lo each loans would be an example of the capital. So the question was, if you loaned a billion dollars for an infrastructure project, who and that and that and the le the borrower went bankrupt, as often happens, as happened to a builder in South End, Ottawa, who will repay taxpayers their billion dollars? I want to thank you for the additional clarity, but I did understand the question. The, uh, the, Nobody can understand getting, your answer because you're well, not giving one yet. I'd like to answer. I'd like to answer. So the uh, bank will be able to have specific projects that it supports in terms of concessional capital or in the terms of loans or loan guarantees. They're good examples. And who would These, repay it? The specific, if, 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 if the builder Pierre, goes Pierre, bankrupt. Pierre, the, the, I'm the, happy to answer your question if you'd like. The, any, any time. We're ready for it. Okay, if you have more to say, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, well, I, I will I'll move on to the, uh, the same clause in the budget bill. gives you the power to offer loan guarantees for a company building infrastructure. That will make the taxpayer the guarantor of a loan. If a company gets a taxpayer guarantee for a billion-dollar project and fails to repay that billion-dollar loan, who will repay it? Floor is yours, Minister. Is it? Yes, it is. Are you ready for me to answer? Well, we've been waiting for you to answer for the duration, uh, so any time now. Who will repay the money? What I was uh, about to say was that in each project, there'll be specific situations. So in many cases, there'll be security behind that loan. So the security behind the loan would mean that if, in the case that you identified, that an organization wasn't able to repay the loan, the security would come back for the uh, federal government in that case. So uh, what I can't do is give you every specific project right now. But what I no, can but, do but is tell... It, it, again, me, would minister. you like to answer the question or not? The question is who would repay it? The, the minister is answering your, your question. Give him time to answer it instead of interrupting. Wait, do you understand the concept of security behind a loan? I do. In fact, Chapter 2 of your budget it touches on that. Uh, it says that you will use subordinated debt. According to Investopedia, subordinated debt is more risky than unsubordinated debt. Subordinated debt is considered any type of lo loan that is repaid after other corporate debts and loans are repaid in the case of borrower default. That means that the debt owed to taxpayers would not be secured. The senior debt would be secured. So you're, you're, you're factually wrong. You're contradicting your own budget documents. It would not be secured. The well, actually, the, the, you're the, confused so there, and you're inaccurate. You've know, so been asked, like you've an answer, asked, you've been asked four times who would pay, pay back the taxpayer. So if a builder takes a billion dollar loan from your taxpayer backed infrastructure bank and goes bankrupt, who would repay taxpayers? A, no one, B, the tooth fairy, or C, would you take it out of your personal retirement funds?
Who sure. would repay taxpayers? So, uh, I'm Minister, we are going to give you time to answer that question, and your time's up, Mr. Polyev. Go ahead. I appreciate the opportunity to reply. So, the good uh, design that we've put in place for the Canada Infrastructure Bank would allow us to create an agency with expertise around how you can deliver on uh, complex financial arrangements to make sure that significant infrastructure projects actually get done. That would mean that what's required is not only seeking institutional investors, but considering the possibility of also finding ways to ensure that projects get done that might require loans, or in some cases, loan guarantees. We've given the bank flexibility to do that. Of course, we'll be relying on the expertise of this agency in order to make sure that they do this on commercially successful terms, as we do with other Canadian government uh, organizations like the Business Development Bank, like the Export Development Corporation that are very successful in terms of not only being able to provide loans, but being able to provide returns to the Canadian government through those loans. That's what we expect would happen in this case. We will be able to do more infrastructure through crowding in private sector investment. We'll be able to create structures that provide financing opportunities that allow us to get more done while creating better outcomes for Canadians, both through jobs and through long-term better infrastructure and a low level of financial risk. Mr. Albas, a uh, slightly more than five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for you and your uh, deputies to be here today. Certainly appreciate your presence. Um, you know, I, I would like to just to touch on the infrastructure bank. Obviously, it's, it probably should be called an infrastructure corporation because it won't be providing banking services, uh, so to speak. But, Minister, uh, just in context of this, right now I'm hearing from insurance companies that say the new OSFI's capital requirements on, uh, for them to invest in Canadian infrastructure is going the opposite direction of the rhetoric of, of your government. Uh, they're saying that right now, that of, of January uh, 2018, that the new capital requirements actually make it more difficult for Canadian insurance companies uh, who have traditionally invested billions, uh, I think 70 billion in, in Canadian infrastructure. Can you explain why you are so gung-ho on an infrastructure bank uh, that basically is to attract foreign investment while at the same time actually make it more difficult for Canadian companies to invest in Canadian infrastructure? Well, thank you for the question. I, I think this is actually a useful thing for us to talk about. Uh, the two things you're bringing up we see as entirely separate. So. As we think about the uh, capital requirements for banks and for insurance companies, what we're thinking about in that regard is what are the requirements that those institutions need in order to protect the people that are, in the case of banks, putting their deposits with a bank, or in the case of insurance company, people that are buying policies. The reason we expect capital requirements to be there is because we want to make sure that banks or insurance companies have the long-term sustainability that they need in order to pay out those depositors or those policy holders when the time is due. So that is the sole way that we're going to look at those capital requirements. With respect to the way those institutions decide to invest their money, uh, that will be based on those capital requirements that they have. So, That's the approach. Now, so this is, as when, to the when, second part of your, your question, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank is an entirely different body. This body is not a body for which there will be uh, depositors in that classic sense or policy holders. Instead, its goal is to increase the amount of infrastructure investment that goes on by using outside capital to come in on a project-by-project -project basis. So that outside capital, though, um, Minister, and this goes back to uh, Mr. Polyev's point earlier, is, is that uh, they won't be subject to the same rules about how much capital that they need to have in reserves. Is that correct? They won't be bound by the same rules uh, uh, that, uh, that we're going to be expected of insurance companies come January 2018. Uh, that is absolutely correct. There, we're and talking about two very separate, separate things. So an insurance company's capital requirements rules are based on the actual goal of that institution. And our goal as the prudential regulator of those institutions is thinking about protecting those people within it. The Canada Infrastructure Bank is actually looking to do something quite different. So if you can't, if you can't you know, make sure that there is uh, proper reserves for those companies that will be investing in these projects, Minister, what happens if a project goes bust? 
what happens uh, when the, uh, that money has to be paid back but either through a loan guarantee through the government or, again, uh, through, uh, uh, you know, through the financing by the taxpayer. Won't, so, won't taxpayers end up being holding the bag then in that case, especially if they don't, if they're not regulated at the same level as Canadian insurance companies and banks? So again, this is a separate kind of institution. So the projects that we're talking about will be projects that investors will come in to invest in because they will see the business opportunity they, there. They'll see the business opportunity because there'll be an opportunity for perhaps their, their pensioners who could well be Canadians who are invested in the pension fund that those uh, opportunities will be there for those streams of income. If, so, for example, there was a, uh, a project in which uh, one particular investor, for some reason or another, didn't stay involved in that project, the continuing uh, business attributes of the investment would be there, meaning that it would still be yeah. possible for another investor to come but in again, and take But again, there'll be position. two separate forms of rules, one where the taxpayer ends up holding the bag, while the other one you have a very tightly regulated where there's capital put in place. And so I just disagree with, uh, with that kind of thinking, Minister. We should be encouraging uh, Canadians to be investing in Canada. Um, I'd like no, just you're, quickly you're move into excise duties. the nature of what we're trying to no, do here. Minister, just to are be you clear, aware that the, that the excise duties on wine have increased by 125% since 1980? And that the new measures that you're uh, proposing um, will basically be 2% uh, uh, per year uh, forever. Now, that's going to take a lot of investment out of wineries right across this great country, but also um, microbrewers and breweries and spirits. They are very, very subject to or sensitive to excise changes. Minister, have you done any work to see what, the, what that will do to the jobs and the, and the investment? Because this country right now, we are at the lowest levels of business investment since 1981. So, Minister, you know, have you done the homework when it comes to this particular sector and how sensitive it is, considering they pay all the other taxes? And by the way, excise ends up provincially as well as federally, then you add the GST or HST, depending on where you're, from, where, where you're making it. So, Minister, this is, there's, there's going to be increases right across the board. Have you done the homework? Let me come back to the first part of your comment to again say that the Canada Infrastructure Bank, on a project-by-project -project basis, will seek outside investors, and uh, that is exactly what we uh, hope to do in order to increase the amount of infrastructure investment that goes on in this country. Uh, the advantage will be that we will have uh, outside investors that will allow us to do more, and uh, that is entirely separate and distinct from banking or insurance company regulation, and uh, the two should not in any way be confused. With respect to uh, the uh, decision to uh, not allow excise tax to decline over time, uh, we've decided that what we will do is to ensure that uh, inflation, which occurs in our economy, as you may know, uh, will be able to be considered because the excise taxes will be subject to inflation like uh, other aspects of our economy are subject to inflation. So that, uh, we believe, is an approach that will uh, just be uh, long-term uh, positive in order to provide but Minister, predictability around uh, those excise taxes excise over time. Excise are ad valorem, so at the price and, of the wine Dan, goes we're, up we're substantially, uh, because of inflationary we're reasons, substantially it's going to continue time, to do Dan, that. Dan, I, just, I just disagree with that, and we'll, I don't think we'll his department you, has done the homework, Mr. Chairman. We'll Chair. give you a, a, a minute later to follow that line of thought. But, uh, before we leave the whole question around this infrastructure uh, outfit, I wanted to just get clarity on a comment you made to my colleague uh, if I heard you correctly, you indicated the uh, new infrastructure corporation would operate similar to the Export Development Corporation and Business Development Bank, which I believe are both 100% backstopped by the Canadian government. And if that's the case, and there are bad loans in those organizations, then it is in effect the taxpayer that would pick up that bad loan. And so then, is, is that your answer to Mr. Polyev's question, that if there's a bad loan within this within this new infrastructure corporation, that it would in fact be the taxpayer that would pick it up. Mr. Minister. Well, thank you for the question and the opportunity to clarify. Uh, what I said was, was that this institution would be uh, finding ways to crowd in private sector capital. And among the ways that that might be done would be to consider loans and loan guarantees that might allow for projects that might otherwise not be economic to become economic. 
uh, in the case of each specific project, we expect that the project would have dynamics that would entice uh, investors to be involved in that project, uh, which would mean that there was, uh, in many cases, security for uh, whatever it is that they might have had a loan or a loan guarantee for. So that's important. Uh, we do expect that in, in many cases that won't be necessary, in some it might. Each project will be uh, specific to that project. I expect that what will happen is that the uh, security that might be there might uh, create the opportunity for us to have uh, loans that work to make sure these projects are successful. Okay, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit. If my uh, colleague, Mr. Deltel, would, was here, he would ask one simple question. When are you going to balance the budget? <laughs> Mr. Minister. Uh, and if your colleague, Mr. Deltel, was here, I would want to spend time reminding him on how successful our efforts have been to, uh, to deal with what we okay. saw so as a challenging environment when we came into office. Happily, uh, we are seeing a situation where employment has improved in this country, a very positive outcome, I'm sure, across the country, likely in all the ridings that we represent. I'd also okay. point out I, that I asked uh, one simple question, when are you going to balance the budget, the and you, you haven't better. answered it, oh, so I, I want to go on to the next question. Okay, well, let's hear your next question. Okay, the next question is... Uh, so I'm looking at uh, Division 2, Part 4, which uh, allows for the borrowing up to $1.3 trillion. Uh, Mr. Minister, if, I, uh, if my calculations are correct, during your four years as Finance Minister, uh, that uh, budget debt will increase to, by about $80 billion. You comfortable with that, being your legacy? Mr. Minister. We are very much looking at a legacy of uh, creating success for Canadians and for Canadian families. Uh, we know that behind the uh, 250,000 new jobs over the last year uh, that we've created in this country are families that are now being more successful. We know that in each one of those situations they're creating better economic outcomes. We know that to the extent that we can grow the economy more rapidly than it was growing when we came into office because of the lack of investment before, that we can actually find ourselves in a better long-term situation which will improve our uh, economy and as a result improve our fiscal health. Okay, just to be sure that the record is clear that uh, when this government took over almost two years ago, the budget was balanced. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, you talk about uh, legacy for Canadians. If my math is correct, I think when you're done as finance minister, every Canadian will have a legacy of something like uh, at least $17,000 per person owing. Again, are you comfortable with that legacy? Maybe we can be absolutely clear. When we came into office, what we saw were rosier than expected economic growth forecasts, which led to a conclusion that was erroneous, that we would be uh, successful fiscally over the next number of years. In fact, when we looked at the real outcome, the uh, growth was going to be lower, and therefore, uh, as you know, we have had made investments to try and deal with that growth. What Canadians will see as a result of our investments, as a result of our uh, government over time is, as I said, more success for their families, a better situation for the long term, and uh, more positive growth in this country. That's not Quick correct, Minister. Your response. own finance department released the numbers that said the budget was balanced at the end of that fiscal year. That's all I have, Mr. Mr. Sure. Minister. Do you want to add further to that? Okay, then uh, nothing.